Sorry, caught me dancing there. Hey, everyone, and a massive welcome to today's second episode here on InfoSec Live of the CISO Experience, where we get to engage with and learn from our industry's leaders in a live setting with real, open and honest conversations. Calm down, Simon. Stop dancing. And for those that are new to the channel, my name's Simon Linstead. I'm the founder of the InfoSec Live community and also your host for this series. And by sharing stories and best practice over the last few months, it's now led to 30,000 views and six and a half thousand hours of our content being watched here on YouTube by you, our amazing subscribers. So a huge thank you for your engagement. And if you'd like to support the wider InfoSec Live community, or indeed, buy me a cheeky decaf coffee, we do have a few ways that you can show your appreciation. First up, the ability to purchase super stickers in the chat if you'd like your question bumped up to the top, and three tiers of membership, allowing you to show your support in any way that you can. But whether you join or not, being here and engaging with our content is what really matters. So if you're watching this live, please do like and subscribe. We try to make these events as interactive as possible and make sure you drop any questions you may have in the chat. And for my aging eyesight, if you can mark them with a big Q, that would be amazing. And if you're watching on replay, please still drop those questions in and I'll make sure them ask them to our next guest on the next show. After all, it's you, our audience, who make these events so special. And in fact, thanks to you, our audience, the CISO experience is kicking off its United Kingdom and United States in real life tour in February with multiple locations across both countries countries with an exciting series of events aimed at bringing our leadership together in a relaxed and informal setting with a focus on networking and knowledge sharing, not sales pitches. And our first event is on the 23rd of February in Cambridge, UK in the old technology museum there, proudly sponsored by Cyberscale and supported by the Cyber East Partnership, with the next in Atlanta, Georgia, potentially in, in mid to late March, with a date to be confirmed very soon. But if you're interested in finding out more about attending, sponsoring, collaborating, please do reach out to me today, either through LinkedIn or the InfoSec Live community, where the link is in the comments below. So before we begin quick moment to thank our amazing show sponsor for helping us grow and provide even more free and engaging content to the community. And for us, sponsorship is about partnering with the right organizations, especially in such a saturated vendor marketplace. And No Name Security are the only company out there taking a complete proactive approach to API security, working with 20% of the Fortune 500 and covering the entire API security scope across three pillars, posture management, runtime security, and API security testing, backed by leading venture capital firms and have raised $220 million, achieving unicorn status just one year out of stealth. And that is quite some achievement. Anyway, link to find out more about the amazing No Name and how they can help your organization is in the description below. And also, if you're looking for work, which I know a couple of you in the chat are, make sure you check out their career page as I know they're hiring at the moment. Okay, time for the exciting bit. Time for our next guest, Sky Sharma. Sky is a career technology executive, CIO, CISO, and CXO. And as a senior cybersecurity consultant in the private sector, he's helped to shape the cybersecurity practice of several companies, supporting the DHS, US Coast Guard, US Navy, and US Marine Corps in several areas in the cybersecurity domain. Sky has notably improved several companies. And during his 20 years in the US Air Force, he supported the military health system. America's military health system, M MHS, is a unique partnership of medical educators, medical researchers, and healthcare providers, and their support personnel worldwide. The Department of Defense Enterprise consists of the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, the medical departments of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, and Joint Chiefs of Staff, the combatant command surgeons and TRICARE providers, including private sector healthcare providers, hospitals, and pharmacies. And if I stand here and talk to you about his amazing achievements and everything he um, excels in, we'll be here all day and we won't get time to talk to him. So let's dig into his vast experience. Let's bring him on. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, Simon. How are you? I'm I'm super well, thank you. I'm very, very glad to see you in the studio today. We had a quick catch up before we jumped in, and I'm really, really excited about what we're going to be digging into today. I think, to coin an old-fashioned phrase, we're both singing from the same hymn sheet on a number of things that we can dig into a bit later. Um, before we do that, 
I just want to take a moment to thank everyone in the audience, uh, because again, we've got such an amazing turnout from all the people there tuning in from around the world to hopefully learn, engage, and maybe ask some questions. So a quick shout out to Richard, Sinek, Ellie, hey, how are you? Shane, Art O'Kane, another CISO. We've got Rebecca, we've got Beth, we've got Erasmus. We've got, who else have we got? Hold on, I'm trying to scroll and talk at the same time. Tracy, all the way from the Cayman Islands, not jealous at all. Stephen Dick, thanks very much for tuning in. Rebecca, you're a star. And all of you, thank you very, very much. So time for Simon to stop talking. You'll all be pleased to know. And throw the gauntlet over to Sky and ask you to tell us a little bit more about your journey into the industry and the experiences you've had before. Well, I spent uh, just over 20 years in the Air Force. And originally, um, I um, joined Special Forces, and then I rolled out into uh, became a medic. Um, this is in the in the in the nineties time in the nineteen nineties. Um, uh, after that, you know, I spent my career uh, primarily supporting health information technology. Um, then, of course, we used to call it information security as a whole. You know, then it became you know in, they started throwing around the term cyber, and not just the Department of Defense, but you know, many other areas, um, and it became to be, you know, the, the defined domain of cyber, uh, which was taken from cybernets, right? Yeah. Um, which is an actual science. Um, and so basically, um, taking that concept of the control space of cyber, um, that was applied throughout the whole military, and it led to, you know, a huge outgrowth of different areas, not just agencies, but also competencies that required, um, you know, the military, you know, to kind of source and fund those different capabilities and that, that's that's really how i started you know all the way from a you know i was a hardware technician doing soldering all the way to you know, to now um and it's what, been, what was it's been it great. what was it that got you interested at the start though what was it that got you bitten by the tech bug i suppose well i mean i've always you know done that but but of course you know i i was it was kind of shocking to be able to you know i was in that that phase where you know you you'd have to use public library resources for most any research, you know, at one time, but, you know, I was, it was kind of just, just amazing that you could access, you know, the library of Congress, for instance, uh, over the internet and have access to resources like that and be able to write a college paper and source almost anything without having to leave your seat. That, that those, those kind of things really kind of, you know, m boggled my mind. And on top of that, you know, where gaming has gone from Pong to virtual reality and augmented reality, <laughs> Um, I thought, you know, graphics and the, the use of virtual uh, virtualization and, and major motion pictures um, and uh, the integration of now where it's there's no such thing as a unless you're looking at a, a passion piece done on a small budget. Most everything is highly computerized, you know, in terms yeah. of animation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, I mean, for me, I know we're not here to talk about me and I promise not to talk too much. It was a Commodore VIC-20 that did it for me back in the 1980s that I was trying to learn to program basic on. And I think my my first attempt at being a, a hacker, I suppose you could call it that, was carving a groove in my Commodore 64's disc to try and get a bit more memory from it. And I want to touch on how much things have changed since then. And this was brought up in the stream this afternoon with Steve Cobb. I blamed Video Plus, if you can remember that, when they launched okay. the device on your remote where you could just put the numbers in to control your, your recordings on your TV. And it's a bit of a flippant comment. But when when I was involved in technology and my computer and video players and all this stuff back in the 80s, you didn't get an instruction manual that you could understand. You had to get your hands in and understand it yourself. And I think I make the comment about Video Plus because as soon as it got to the point where you could just put a number in and it would record, you know, the Golden Girls for you at 7 p.m. or whatever it might be, we've lost the lost the ability. Well, not the ability. We've lost the interest in trying to work out how things work and understand how they work, which I think has led to lots of challenges in different sectors with regards to something we were talking about before, which is the lack of critical thinking. Right. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, that puts you in a space of discomfort. And so, you, you know, in popular, a lot of the popular thought process is to, to move towards comfort. But, you know, you, you can't do that. If, you, you know, you've got to stay in the, the discomfort, you know, you have to stay in that zone and uh, figure out the most, you know, efficient and, and best way out of a situation. Um, and, you know, we're talking about technology. Um, you know, it's... Um, 
there's several examples, but you just related to streaming media or, you know, how that's changed things. But I think the best example of that is Blockbuster and kind of the demise of oh, Blockbuster. Favorite story. And the, yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, 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 not only were the signs there, but, you know, they were, they were literally shown a roadmap to, to, to leave, you know, a situation that was untenable. But instead of moving towards streaming, they just became, you know, a thing of the dinosaurs, basically, yeah. uh, you know, um, they extincted themselves. So they did with a, with a little bit of help from Netflix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but again, that that goes back to, um, I suppose, the power of disruption in any industry and the importance of adaptability as well. And let's talk about disruption for a moment, because it's one of my favorite subjects. Do you see any positive disruption happening in this space? And if not, what should be happening in this space to make it better? Uh, positive in, in, in cybersecurity as a whole. Yeah. You're talking about. Um, y- yeah. I mean, it definitely in this disruption is long term. It's not it's 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 going to be, you know, s- similar to the introduction of um, propulsion in, into yeah. into transportation. And when I say when I say that, I don't just mean aerial propulsion. I also mean on the ground, you know, the, the use of the gasoline engine, things of that nature. I mean, this is a long term disruption. It's it it's um it's occurring in phases and it scales and at the speed of technology, um so I I hate to use you know simply say AI is the catch all it seems to be for everything, but yeah. AI and all of its, of its subsets you know uh, uh, different you know specific subsets control languages that involve robotics, yeah. you know or or you know higher level languages that involve you know pure logic. And problem solving, you know, like uh, GP3, GPT, GPT3, or any of the other, you know, similar technologies. Um, there's there's where the most disruption is going to occur, and that be- is because those things are at currently the most scalable. Yeah, and do do you think? I mean, Chat GPT. Um, it was said in the press, I think, last week or the week before. That it's like an iPhone moment for the AI industry. And, and I do wonder if it will be. And I think, you know, we can definitely already see lots of different potentially really good use cases from it, um, especially from a customer success and engagement point of view. I think that there'll be a, a big change in the type of jobs created moving forward and where companies can save money on that in particular. And the importance for me is working out for those who are in the industry and aspiring to be in the industry, where to focus on to ensure you're going to have a job in the next five to 10 years. Right, right. Yeah. If you if you're if you're not heavy and also, you know, not only that, but also in attribution, which would be, you know, um, distributed ledger or crypto, you know, yeah. um, if you're not heavy in those spaces, I don't think you you know, I'm not saying that you won't be relevant, but you're, you're not going to be operating on on the edge of innovation because they're, they're just they're there. They're embedded in every um, sector. Um, yeah. And I think I think when we say crypto, people tend to think of cryptocurrency, not not actual, you know, not the distributed ledger, which is what I'm referring to. Um, yeah. So there's cryptocurrency, and that's sure that's you know payment systems, uh, modes of payment, um, asset management, things of that nature. But there's also distributed ledger, which could involve and does involve contracts or yeah. um, attribution methods of attribution, where you can have uh, you know a a a, a very very well laid out architecture that allows people to have more secure transactions. And it's, it's also from a, uh, let me put my, my legal hat on uh, and look at the legal industry here in the UK and the US. It's great from a chain of evidence point of view as well, potentially, you know, making sure you've got that in place and knowing what, I don't know what it's like in the US, but I know most of our lawyers and solicitors over here are still using Zoom for their meetings between clients, you know, they're still transferring documents by email. I mean, it's just an accident waiting to happen. And I think the smart companies who come out with the solution that provides that could definitely be one of the ones on the top 10 list we see in the next few years. But let me let me take a step back to your military career. You spent 20 years in the military. How important has the knowledge gained and experience gained within that helped you as a leader in the cybersecurity industry? Um, I, I mean, I would say it's priceless, you know, uh, um, I, you know, it's, um, I, I consider it, a, uh, I consider myself to be very fortunate to have served in the military and to have had a great career. 
Um, I, I love the Air Force. I always will. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, a really it's a key component to my life. Um, and um, it's, you know, the military, you know, that's what they do. They, they build leaders, you know, kind of from the ground up. And it's yeah. been a great, um, you know, not just experience, but I, I don't I don't know if I could quite quantify the effect. It's, it's been pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I, I bet. And, you know, there's an awful lot of correlation there. The amount of leaders we have on who are, you know, from a military background, there's definitely, it's definitely something in it. And we, and we were talking about the lack of critical thinking um, before we came on air. And I think one thing you see with the leaders who've had military service is critical thinking in droves. And I think that makes, makes a huge difference. And also the ability to build up a team around them of individuals with trusted relationships. I think this is, you know, for most of the leaders I speak to, not being a leader in this industry, but being one in a previous one, having people around you with areas of expertise that you haven't got that you can trust and rely on in certain situations is absolutely invaluable. How, how important has it been building up those relationships since leaving the military? A great deal. Um, I, I'm still very close with almost every, I mean, it, it's hard to keep in contact with everyone. Um, and, and LinkedIn has helped a lot because, you know, people move on and you don't always, you're not always able to, um, keep in close contact with them. Um, and, and the more people, you know, the more of a struggle it becomes. Um, but, um, you know, it's been, uh, when you say how important has it been, what aspect of that do you, do you mean? How important has, I think, yeah, network? sorry, poor, poorly, poorly worded question. Um, not just the network you had from the military. I think what I was, what I was alluding to was the importance of building up a trusted network post-military <clears throat> to support you in your career as a security leader. Oh, it's, it's, it's essential. Yeah, it's yeah. essential. Without it, I don't think you really have a career. Um, you know, you really have to have a trusted relationships and, and that, that only comes through, you know, what I call like, you know, kind of, you know, kind of performance through execution or, yeah. or, or, you know, uh, real time relationships that are built. The, the, the human level has to be there. It's really, really important. Yeah. Well, that we, we can talk about um, the automation of sales and how poorly that's performing later on. But I think for the moment, there's a couple of questions I just want to pick up <clears throat> from the audience there. Um, we've got Beth here, also in the US. In the five pillars of ZTA, you mentioned using an SDP for access control. Do you recommend using AI for this process? And what controls would you put in place to secure it if AI is used? I wish I understood the question. I'm hoping you do. Well, yeah. So, uh, software defined perimeter, um, uh, the, uh, the, the dark cloud, uh, yeah. that, that's, that's, uh, you know, something that really was spearheaded by the defense information systems agency or DISA in the mid two thousands. Um, that's a really important, that's a really important concept and it's a very, it, it, it it's a bulwark for VPN. Uh, so, um, and it's, it, it's, I do, it is a really important, uh, I think, development. And also, how would AI bolster that? Well, it's going to make it more scalable, number one, uh, and the threat vectors yeah. are more manageable, right? And um, I, you're not, you're not going to decrease the attack surface. We know that's not going to happen. But can you make it more manageable? Yeah, yeah, much more uh, using yeah, that. Yeah, you, other... you think AI, AI will help with that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It really will. Um, so, I mean, people say that we can decrease the attack vector, but without going too far down that that rabbit hole, I mean, data is the commodity. And um, if, you, if you say data is a commodity, what's riding on top of that that's so critical? Privacy, uh, you know, so that's, you know, data privacy ultimately is what we're trying to ensure. And uh, when they say security, but that's really a subset of, of, of the privacy Absolutely. Um, some people, I, they may be interchangeable if you're talking about physical security versus the virtual, right? It's possible. But, yeah. you know, really, if we think about it, it's a subset of that. And um, what controls would I use? Uh, would I apply that to um, as many as I could? Um, if we're talking about control families, I mean, there's so many, um, you know, over a thousand um, that at least with the NIST, right? With the yeah. NIST. Uh, but, you know, if you're talking about, you know, actual controls, boy, that, that's... Um, you know, a really big challenge is IDAM, right? Um, identity management. Um, I would look to, you know, really, really see if that we could really get ZTA 
in that process. Z, I mean, it sounds really, if you look at ZTA, it sounds so easily achievable, but it's not uh, be, because execution, like everything else, it isn't. Get, get, going back going back to your comment on assets, uh, I, know, I know you've worked for very large organizations and the government. However, when it comes to not even smaller organizations, but maybe some of the older organizations out there. Some of the sometimes it's come up in conversation about the difficulty of getting the CEOs and the C suite of these organizations to understand the importance of what they would say are untangible assets over tangible assets. And you mentioned it there, data being the most important one. I think some companies are still playing catch up and realizing that that is the case. Yes. They definitely are. I mean, because really, I, I'm really struggling to find an industry off the top of my head right now, as we speak, where data is not commoditized. I, re yeah. I really, you know, right now in today's day and age, I really can't. I can't think of anything. Even if you were to talk about a guy that's selling hot dogs out of a cart, you know, he's likely going to have a payment, except unless he's a cash only business, you know, he's going to likely have a payment, a point of service of some type, of course, right? Yeah. Payment system. Um, and there you have it. That's there's right there. That's, that's, your, that's um, where data security is extremely important. I had, a, um, I had a conversation with someone the other day uh, about the importance of relevant training to different people. So you can't give everyone the same, you know, awareness training. It just doesn't work. And the analogy they used was a, a garage of mechanics, you know, who there's little point you giving them phishing training because none of them ever check their emails. But what the training they do need is the fact they've got this massive PDA device that they plug into everyone's cars that they update through the internet, you know, once a week. And again, it's it's making sure the topic and the story is relevant to the audience. And I think as an industry still in its infancy, we're pretty poor at that. And we have been pretty poor at that. But I think things are starting to improve, definitely. Um, let, me, let me go back to Splodge's question here which kind of focuses a little bit on what we were talking about already, but it's about your military experience and how much that's helped with people management skills should be on the end because he added it on later. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, a great deal. I mean, I mean, that's, uh, um, you know, your, your ability to communicate written and orally, you know, th those are really important in the military, but they are, I think in life in general. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's specific formal types of communication that you learn in the military though, not necessarily, um, applied in the civilian world, but, you know, you can carry those over, you know, um, and, you know, not only that, but, you know, the specific management styles um, and the different situations, your exposure to different situations, I think really has helped a lot. So situationally um, having exposure to different environments at the same time and different situations, scenarios with, you know, human beings, you know, that's what yeah. we, you know, that's, I mean, our ability to, you know, make that human, you know, make, make people, they're not our number. Um, you know, none of us are, um, even though the military is a massive and immensely capable organization. And, you know, when people say you can't pivot uh, a warship, you know, on a dime military does it. Uh, it, no. it can be a little painful, but, but they, they do pivot, uh, very, uh, at, at scale for organizations that size, um, it, it does, it is, it is, um, financially expensive, right. Um, yeah. but, um, I don't know, you know, any investment, uh, given in such a large capability generally is you really can't, um, scale up, um, you know, a, a military like that in the United States, which is extremely capable. And, and even as we, we talk about it, there's so much more there that doesn't really get discussed. Um, in, if you've served anyone that served knows what I'm talking about, it's, it's um, more than impressive. Um, and it, my ability to communicate and manage people has been, you know, I don't, I don't know once again, how to quantify that, but they, 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 that's what the military does. They build leaders. Yeah. Um, but so I think, I think the, mo the motivational, leaders. the motivational side of it is hugely important, I think. And yeah, it, lacking, it is lacking in a lot of leaders who don't have that experience. And that's when you see, see teams start to fail. If you haven't got the ability or the technique to be able to motivate your staff. And also I suppose the empathy is hugely important as well, which is something that lots of people are very badly lacking. But let me bring up, let me bring up the next one. Otherwise, we'll start getting behind. I'm very good at that. Oh, let me switch you to the top. Otherwise, it will cut your head off. Here we go. There we go. Right. I'll cut mine off and I can do this. 
<laughs> with respect <laughs> with respect to those individuals looking to break into cybersecurity, which areas do you feel are best to pursue, considering the diverse fields of different roles one could one could pursue and recent cutbacks in IT? Where do you see the need for skills gaps? Hold on, let me just read the rest of the question. Where do you see the need for skill gaps are in the cyber field? Well, for me, um, I always I always push to you know know your personality and know well you know and because if you pursue something you really hate, number one you won't you won't stick to it, and right. you'll make an investment both financially, emotionally, and time wise that may be very costly to you. You may I, I wouldn't say you regret it, but you might kick yourself later and say, hey, why did I why didn't I just go for this other part of that? But I I always encourage the most technical possible. Um, if I say that, I don't necessarily mean the most difficult, but the most technical, like for instance, um, DevSecOps or DevOps um, is extremely important. Um, yeah. And um, I know there's the learn to code thing. Everyone says that learn to code, but but yeah. learning a coding language is extremely immensely, is immensely important, I think, because it's a part of the modern fluency now. We're not, we're not in that, we're in that phase where, um, there's international languages and those languages are computer languages. Yeah. hundred, hundred percent. I think, I think again, the, the question was, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I could not agree with you more on the self-discovery part. I think that's where most people fall down. They get blinded by, you know, the couple of job descriptions that they see advertised all the time. They don't look at where their previous experience is. They don't look at what drives them and they don't look like I didn't a few years ago, at what your actual idea of success really is. And, we, we've spoken about this before offline. I mean, me for me, success is a mindset, not a destination. And I think for 45 years of my life, I was trying to get to somewhere I was never going to get to, which is that that hamster wheel of life that we all get pushed on, where we're told to always aspire and go for something next. You know, it starts off at primary school. You're looking forward to high school. Then it's college. Then it's your first car. Then it's your first job. And then it's a promotion. Then it's a holiday. Then a better car. And I don't know. For for me, living in the moment and being present and being thankful for what we have is far more important than chasing shiny things, Sky. No, I agree. It definitely is. Because um, there's always a new shiny thing to chase. There is. No, absolutely. Yeah, right. Away from shiny things, Simon. Um, what's your thoughts on <laughs> vendor offered zero trust architectural solutions? Are we just displacing trust to a third party or are they authentically being built on ZTA principles. Great question, Jeff. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, that is a great question. It's it's a complex one. Um, so I I I, can, I tend to steer away from a magic bullet solution um, because you, you know everybody has <laughs> everyone's yeah. we're the best we're the best um, um, they have that and then there's the other part of that is um, security is based on the assumption of risk. So yeah. who's assuming it? And how much? Yeah. And, you know, you look at that and then so because nothing is 100 percent secure. If it is, it's unusable. Um, and, you know, and that's you know, you can make a, you know, a weapon system 100 percent secure by making it unusable. Nobody can use it. I mean, it's you know, so um, that's great. But I mean, it's not practical. So no. um, it, so you have um you have that concept, right? And, and um, so are we just, yeah, we're outsourcing risk, just like we do with insurance. Basically, yeah. we're outsourcing the risk at, on the hopes that this, this, uh, I don't want to use the magic bullet again, but this, this company does have the magic bullet. <laughs> it's going to solve all of our issues. And we can tell the C-suite, hey, this is great. You know, it's for this small subscription fee and it's, it's done. But um, I don't know what products you've been looking at with small subscription fees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, I say small. I say small. I'm joking. Yeah. You, you, you know, c compared to the defense budgets, they're all yeah. small. <laughs> I mean, for for me, the, I mean, I, I don't want to moan about vendors too much because obviously, you know, one, we're sponsored by an amazing vendor who I actually do think is pretty good and does a very good job. And I wouldn't have taken them on as a sponsor if I didn't. So it was only because I had three or four CISOs tell me they used them and thought they were good that that I accepted them as a sponsor for the show, which is important to me. But after going to RSA for the first time this year, I mean, yeah. God help anyone trying to make a, make any sense out of the minefield of the products. And it seems like a new one comes out each week. And I think 
again, it's down to the the stage that the industry's in. I mean, you look at all industries and growth phases. We're in a kind of hyper growth phase in cybersecurity at the moment where we've got probably far too many products in the marketplace. And off the back of that product focus, the vendor narrative and their very big budget marketing departments have made a very good job on focusing organizations and leaders on buying tech. And going back, I think it's something you said at, at the start, it's the people part, right? I mean, we, we process, yeah, def- definitely 100%, but the people bit is lacking, in my opinion. It's, it's the wrong way around. It's not people process technology. It's technology process people. Right. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't still fight people to fit the technology. Um, no. That's what a lot of times there's certain products that go that route and uh, it's pretty painful um, to use or to learn. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I wouldn't really say UIX or user interface. That's, 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 you know, at the operational, the tactical interface level, but I would say it's more, you know, in the, in the architecture phase, or, you know, when you're looking at something, you're, how you're really looking at it and, you know, maybe a systems approach would be better yeah. served, but uh, very few people use systems approach, even though it's, there's very few cases in which it's not, it doesn't apply. I, I think, I think for me, oh, you've got to take your hat off to the marketing teams for these businesses because they're hugely successful. And all you hear is CISOs and leaders moaning about <clears throat> the amount of spam or sales messages they get in their LinkedIn folder for example every week right but it's working isn't it it's working because people are buying it and i think we need to see a sea change on what happens next and how to approach it differently And, and going back to something you said at the start about the relationships and the trust surely that's the way for the vendors to really start to get get hold of the market for the ones that are good building those valued relationships and adding adding value before you start asking people you know asking people for things so what would your message be to vendors out there on how they can improve the way they connect with leaders i mean that's a tough one uh because i mean i mean if you're if you really that's a very challenging one because i mean there's of course there's conferences and um you know there's you know in person meetings or there's targeted uh, events that either the government puts on or vendors put on, or some, sometimes they're co-sponsored or sometimes they're industry or NGO driven um, or, or association driven, all of those. Um, those are great uh, places to, 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 you know, kind of impart some humanity instead of a kind of a cold call type of mentality. But, um, you know, something that's demonstrative always seems to work the best has the most impact, but I know it's not easy to do because because I, I myself, I you know, every, we're also challenged on time that making a demonstrative type of um, pitch um, that you could, you know, give somebody in a time efficient way is really hard. That is really difficult. Um, I, I, I don't like to say that some type of tube or a YouTube uh, video or, or a short of some type, um, which we, they've moved towards. I mean, I've seen that Meta is really trying to kind of yeah. inject itself into the space where it's occupied by TikTok uh, and using that in their feed, but something very short um, because we just don't have the time. Um, something demonstrative, but it's really, that's a difficult Demonst- one. That's all demonstrative, I can, that's all I come up with. demonstrative, full of value and short. That's the message. Yeah, that's easy, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good, good luck with that. You're just going to get spammed in your LinkedIn inbox now, aren't you? Um, let yeah. me bring the, the next <laughs> The next one up, uh, where's it gone? Look, I'm not doing very well here. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, let me do the one I can find. Let's do that one for now. Shane, thanks very much for tuning in again. Um, I'm sure last time we spoke, you were off to bed, but that might have been yesterday. I'm a bit confused with the time zones. Um, what are your thoughts on the claim that researchers in China broke RSA? Another good question. Well, um, it's definitely possible. That's all. I mean, uh, uh, those the RSA were best Schirmer Adelsman, you know, the, the three most brilliant guy ever. They're brilliant. Uh, I I don't I don't put it. Uh, you know, I, well, I haven't seen the intelligence reports that that have like the actual stating that this has been done already. Um, the compute capability exists to do that. Yeah, it does exist, and. Um, we, you can use a quantum coprocessor and do almost, I mean, the compute capability. So using a silicon computer 
right? Using a legacy computing system with a quantum coprocessor, you can create, you can just go out of control with the compute capability. It's, 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 the scale is mind boggling. So, so are, I think are we, awesome. we going to be playing catch up on that then? Are we ready for that? Is anyone ready for that? No, no. I, <laughs> we, we, yeah, we are playing catch up. <laughs> we are playing catch up with it. That, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing, you know, everyone's, they're talking about quantum processing and processors like D-Wave, which is a prime example of one of the best. I think D-Wave, I think, is in the top two, if not the premier, you know, on quantum processors. They're doing extraordinary work. They, they basically, um, the processor itself, I mean, you know, in, in the way that it, it's, it's that the ability for the architecture of computing, right, to keep up with a quantum processor is not there. No. The architect, the architecture is not there, which is why a quantum coprocessor with the current silicon legacy architecture, that's workable um, and achievable in terms of uh, cost. Right. And do you, do you think we're going to see th threat actors and nation states utilizing that then quickly? Uh, they already have. Yeah, yeah. They, they definitely already have. I mean, because it's 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 um, you know, they they a state actor has um, access to resources that, you know, uh, smaller organizations or, you know, maybe just activists or hacktivists may not. Um, so some of the more capable ones are possibly do. But, um, yeah, state actors are definitely more. When I say more of a threat, I mean that's a that's a kind of a blanketed statement. I mean, it depends what you're talking about. Yeah, but, well, um, I suppose it's it's the people with the budget, I suppose, to get the kit in the first place that are going to become the biggest threat, and that will probably be nation state actors. Let's be honest, or the very yes. highly funded professional malicious groups out there that you know no no one talks about much. It seems to be you know people say how how many how unlucky you are to get hit, and it's all a numbers game. I completely agree with that. But I also agree that there are some very sophisticated, very professional criminal organizations out there that are very clever with who they target. And I think as an industry, we need to wake up to that a little bit more rather than just thinking it's a bit of a numbers game, which is something that we see sometimes. Um, then the other question, which I've just found and then lost, which I'm really good, was back to ChatGPT. Again, all the way from the Cayman Islands, Tracy, thank you. Thoughts on ChatGPT and its impact on threats to cybersecurity? I can't even say it, cybersecurity. Well, um, so GPTs, um, or ChatGPT especially, uh, you're talking about there's a huge array of threat vectors that can grow out of that by itself. Um, one of them is in the area of social engineering. Um, and, and, you know, that really is, that's going to really up the game in social engineering uh, in terms of, you know, mimicking human um, response, you know, yeah. especially like, you know, so that that's, that's really going to really um, impact. I mean, how much impact, I'm not sure, but really, to be honest, it's the, as long as you can, the compute capability matches the technology you know you're really it's it's formidable it's it's gonna and what, and what, and what about the, the, the comment i heard the other day was that you can instruct it to write a write code to do something that you want it to do i mean i don't know how effective that is but you, if you were a malicious actor it seems that um script kiddies are all of a sudden a lot more dangerous because if they kind of know what they're doing but don't know how to code they can soon get chat gpt to do it instead so for me I mean, that's a concern, but I don't know enough about the technical side of it to know whether that is an actual worry. Yeah, it's, it's similar to thought aggregation um, because any code that's out there is already out there, basically. Yeah. So it, it can function both an aggregator and also you, you can, you know, construct logic instructions, logical instructions. So, yeah, there's a lot it can do a uh, great deal. I mean, you can tell it to write you a novel. It'll do that. Yeah. So you can also instruct it to write you, you know, write a romance novel. It can aggregate that and um, then, um, you know, check, parse all known yeah. you know, novels to see if if you're if you're, um, you know, you know, play, plagiarizing, uh, and uh, then alter then get it the to content. rewrite it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I can do that. I think for me, I mean, I. I've spent sort of in business and marketing and, and for me, there's going to be an awful lot of marketers out of jobs, I think, adapt and change 
and embed and maybe in practices. It'll be a really tough entry for those in sales, especially those on the on the LinkedIn messaging cold out- outreach side, which I think, think generates a lot of business for a lot of companies there. That's something I think that will soon be automated. Now, I'll be very surprised if by the end of this year, we haven't got solutions in the marketplace that can, you know, not only locate and find prospective clients, but then engage the locations as well, which is quite scary, really. It's quite scary. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the, the, it is. It, but but the, the 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 way that I think ultimately it's going to vastly improve consumer engagement so long as Correct. the human the human the human factors there. In other words, it'll make it more scalable uh, and maybe managing queues or customer service queues without customers getting frustrated. It it could, it could really have a great deal of play there. I mean, it's already done in a certain way uh, with automated updates in your current status. I think from a, from a direct sales point of view, if I mean, it, it could vastly improve a salesperson's job. Because as you said, the human element, people buy off, people aren't going to buy off chat GT. They might get engaged, not physically. They might engage with chat GPT conversation, but, but when it comes to building relationships, the human element, which we've talked about before is so, so, so important. So I think that for that initial outreach part, it gives more time to actually speak and have meaningful conversations with people. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that it could be a hugely positive thing for sales um, i'm conscious that we've only got 15 minutes left a whole book full of questions here that i haven't even touched okay. on yet so <laughs> let me start okay. off with, with what book has inspired you the most oh the starfish and the spider uh ori brothman um uh which is a uh, you know it's 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 about uh, you know, the, the power of leaderless, uh, networks, um, uh, and basically organizations, right. Um, it is, you know, one of the best out there at basically elucidating how these systems, biological systems, right. Which functioned in a distributed manner, um, have advantages over hierarchical models um, and the, the, the title is, is, is implicit in the nature of the book or the, basically what was the, what the, was the title again. Please. So, so if you, the, I'll Google the it now. And the spider, it. Uh, Ori, starfish and yeah. Spider, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ori Brofman, O R I Brofman, B R A F M A N. Um, thank you. And, uh, that book is, it's really extraordinary. Uh, like I said, so they, the kind of the two things, uh, one of the, one of the best parts of that is they talk about, the, the the starfish having a distributed architecture in which if you cut off a leg of a starfish it becomes an entirely new starfish and if you cut off all the legs of a starfish it, they, it becomes five different starfish you, or a fish it doesn't die because each <laughs> each leg has yeah each leg has its own biological system full biological system it's I distributed have, uh, whereas that. yeah and uh sometimes they procreate that way they actually cut themselves in half and um they they create two separate starfish yeah and and so basically um you have uh the a spider if you you know if you injure a spider it's pretty much dead or, or it hobbled uh and if you take the head off it's dead it's dead so um it, the comparison there is um pretty extraordinary and the implications of their comparisons with the way organizations are now functioning and have to function to be survivable and resilient and scalable. They have to be that, like the staffing. Is that, you know, distributed. That's right. You really, you, you really have to be, and not, not that there wouldn't be some type of, you know, oversight. That's not, but that would be more of a hybrid, but still uh, that's kind of how you have to have capability at the edge. Um, and um, the organizations that they talk about, um, you know, the natural, um, the natural growth of these organizations in tribal societies, um, they function very much like the starfish very much. Um, and, um, that's why they're so resilient. And I've, I've ordered the book. 
on Audible, not Audible, on my Kindle. So I'm going to have a dig in. Rebecca mentioned in the chat we should have a book club by David Moalem, who is one of the founding members of the Emosec Live community. I put a question out in the community earlier saying, for anyone who can't tune into the shows, there are any particular questions that you want me to ask. And David's suggestion was that we ask all of the leadership what their most inspirational book was. We can start putting together a catalogue of all the recommended books. So I really, really like that. Thank you. Um, on to the next question, which is slightly similar from Jeff. And again, Jeff says, what's the most important lesson you've learned in your professional career? Good question. Um, the most, impressive, most important lesson that I've learned is that um, skilled listening or, or proactive, I mean, true listening for content, for mood, you know, for all that is probably the most important thing that, that you can do during the day. Um, and, and, uh, you know, that, that rolls into, um, you know, emotional maturity and emotional yeah. intelligence, but really emotional maturity. Um, emotional intelligence is something I think people, a lot of folks think is overused in terms of, yeah. you know, terms they hear it a lot. But emotional maturity, I don't think you hear that often, but it's extraordinarily important. Um, and that's one of the key indicators that you'll always see in at least a successful leader is their level of emotional maturity, their, their ability to interpret emotions, their own and the emotions of others and be able to make, you know, really important decisions uh, based on that. Um, not just it's not just the information, you know, the rote information you're hearing, it's the tone of it, the information, um, the tone of it. And the circumstance, the whole thing. Sorry, I'm doing two things at once there. I can't, can't do that. Yeah, the, the two things I wrote down there, um, and it's something that I talk about a lot, a course that's free, InfoSec Live Community on Skills. And in that course, it talks right. about active listening, um, and it talks about the meaning of the word dialogue, which I think is made up of two Greek words. But the meaning of it is, is engaging in a two-way conversation where both both of you have the same the same re the same interest where you are actually processing what they are saying in an empathetic way rather than a conversation which is what time which it may seem like I'm doing sometimes on these streams where you're waiting for the other person to talk rather than actually listening to what they say and I think if people could improve you know whether your job hunting, whether you're looking to, to take on a leadership role, the ability to actively listen and be ethic, the ability to learn about mirroring, body language, um, lots of different things for me won't just help you as a leader, but it'll help you in every aspect of your career. And, and these are things that, you know, introverted people shy away from. And I understand that, you know, I know I'm quite extroverted and I've been kind of doing that now for 30 years. So the reason I enjoy it and I'm good at it is why well it's because of and I think not everyone's natural at certain things but there's definitely the ability for everyone to improve on these and it's really refreshing to hear that from you as a leader that the emotional intelligence side is so important it's the only bit I've got I've got no normal intelligence so it makes me feel better <laughs> um, last, last question from me on here we talked about what books inspire you the most in your journey. It doesn't have to be someone you've worked with. That could be um, anyone, you know, absolutely anyone. Um, so I've had a lot of, you know, you know, you mean as in life and not just career, you mean just in life as, yes. as a whole? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think um, this is going to sound maybe to a lot of people a little a little, uh, a little funny, but I think I, I, I've, I've really taken a lot from uh, Christian Ronaldo and his journey because I think for someone to occupy that space as a human being, because for most he's not human. He, he's no, I mean for most he's, he's like superhuman. Yeah. He's that's right. He's superhuman, and to have watched this young man, you know, maintain 
I mean, there's humility and there's, you know, there's braggadocio, you know, you're going to have it as an athlete, as a professional athlete and confidence. Um, he has that, right. He has all that, but, but it, it doesn't cross the line. It's really, he, to me, it doesn't, it, to me, he's, he has humility in many aspects of his life, especially the relationship with his mother and the relationship with his family, Mother, Yeah, uh, it, which, right. Which I think a lot of folks can't, I, I it's, to me, I can't imagine to be that much of a celebrity and to have that many. I mean, he, he is the highest paid athlete, I think, in history thus far. He's he's just an extraordinary force. And to to, to be able to operate that way, I, I find him inspirational. Yeah. Do you know, do you know, a lot of people here don't like him, especially Manchester United managers don't like him, particularly at the moment. But, right. but for me, the right. biggest thing yeah. is his relationship with, with his mum. Right, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's that I, shit I, that inspires that me. Right, yeah, I, 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 I know, think. Sorry, I, I, I think Sky, we've got a we've got a bit of a delay, delay here, so you keep um, okay. hearing after I've spoken. So when I stop speaking now, I'm going to be quiet and let you speak. Stop. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know. With uh, man, the leadership, there's he said quite a few things uh, that have um, you know not just uh, that are controversial, but um, that, you know, you know, he, he's kind of, I think kind of went to battle, uh, with those guys, <laughs> but, but, um, and fair, I think I'm just, saying, yeah, as, as a person though, like you said, with the relationship with his mother, I just think to be able to, to, to be that much of a, of a, a, a operate in that space to literally, I mean, footballers, right. Or soccer players in the United States, right. Um, have a presence that's international in the world of sport that no one else does. Um, and they, they have a, a yeah. they have several functions, both as ambassadors, international ambassadors, you know, as of goodwill. Uh, even if you're not their fans, they just, the, the way they conduct themselves says a lot about um, people have a tendency to relate to the country or the way they do through athletes. So I think they just have, there's a lot there that some that uh, it's kind of a subtle kind of influence that they curry um not just the mass the billions and billions of dollars that they bring to the the economy it's not only that it, i think it's also you know the fact that they have this this kind of super temporal effect um that uh i think is observable if you just kind of pay attention uh and it's pretty pretty extraordinary i just think he's very good at that yeah, um, Tracy. So, uh, by the way, everyone, I know there's a bit of a delay, and I think it's probably my end because I'm having problems on my internet. So, I massively apologise if it's caused any problems. And Tracy, you've just uh, a question in there saying, "Do you believe China claims to have broken the quantum computing?" I think, I think we answered that a little while ago. Um, Sky did talk about that a little bit in detail, and I think the answer was, whilst we haven't seen any definitive proof from the military, we're of the mind that yes, that probably is completely true um we're pretty much we're pretty much out of time we've got a couple of minutes left so rather than tempt fate and lose connection completely in two minutes i'm going to wrap things up now to make sure that embarrassment doesn't happen so let me just take a moment now to say a massive thank you to everyone in the chat for jumping in and making it another really a really massive thank you to you, Scott, for taking the time and coming on and sharing your spirit experience and stories with us. And last bit from me, last, I suppose, sales pitch is back to the question about what can vendors do differently to approach CISOs? Well, funnily enough, we've got a series of UK and US events launching next month where we're looking for some sponsorship as well. So if you are interested in getting together with between 30 and 40 CISOs in a room, not to sales pitch them, that is very important you understand that. This is about building relationships, knowledge sharing, adding value, and that, for me, is the way to start building relationships with these industry professionals. And I'm super excited to meet some of you face to face over the coming months. So before we go, Sky, any words of wisdom for those in the audience who are looking to break in to the cybersecurity industry? Oh, yeah, it's it's definitely, uh, despite what anyone says, it's definitely the growth industry for the, the near and the midterm. You know, um, the far term, it's going to be more implicit. I think it's not even be questioned. They'll have entire universities, I think, dedicated to it uh, because it's such an important um, subject matter. 
Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I encourage everyone to step out of their comfort zone and just to dive in uh, because um, th that's where you'll find the, I think the best opportunities when you, you kind of leave your comfort zone and, and, and move into the area where you didn't realize you could possibly be really, really effective. I, I completely agree. And again, before you do that, make sure you do the self-discovery part and work out what is success to you right. and that you're going to enjoy the job. And just, just quickly touching on, um, you said that you think it will be prevalent everywhere in the education system. I've got some quite exciting news. Um, here in the UK, I've been working alongside ThreatGen, a gamification platform based in Texas, with a group of colleges um, who are launching a pilot scheme in two weeks' time, which will be the first adult education college course over here in the United Kingdom solely focused on cybersecurity rather than it being computer science or another generic title. And the fact that we have bringing gamification into that to help with the learning process. For me, as someone who was brought up with computer games, I'm very, very excited about it. And I'm very much looking forward to working with that group of colleges this year and hopefully rolling it out across the whole of the UK if we can. So it's a fingers crossed for me. But Sky, thank you so, so much for coming on. I really, really do appreciate it. You're actually my last guest for, I think it's a 10 day break. I've done six live streams this week. It's been full on, so I have got a bit of space next week. If anyone fancies a little sneaky live stream and you want to jump in as a guest, do drop me a line. I can fit one in on Tuesday and Wednesday. If not, I'm back with Mr. JJ Davey for um, it isn't the CISO experience. It's going to be the SOC experience, and that's in about 10 days' time. So, everyone, thank you so much. Sky, you've been an absolute gentleman. Have a great weekend. See you soon. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a nice weekend. Okay. We'll be